Hollywood's kind of like that. You know, she wants to be a star, and I have, I even have her like think this, and Granny thinks this too. That Hollywood seems like a thin place, and I think it is that kind of thing where you're a normal person and a mortal, and then everyone goes there and is like, I want to be a star. Even that, it's like you're celestial. You're in the heavens. You've transgressed the stratosphere, and you're out there in the Milky Way where other people don't go. And it's like cool, but then like once you get there, like space is cold and it's lonely. Like you got your wish. Like. Is it what you wanted? So. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Burns, and uh, today I'm going to be uh, interviewing the best-selling novelist Kathleen Rooney to discuss her new book, From Dust to Stardust. Um, this is my first time um, doing a video format like this, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, I'm the author of the novel uh, Royal Beauty Bright and the upcoming novel My Dear Antonio. And uh, I'm on a mission to interview authors and see if there's a thing or two I can learn from them. Um, so I've known Kathleen Rooney for about a year and a half. Um, so a funny story, uh, my cousin was reading her book, um, previous book, Share on Me and Major Whittlesey. If that, is that pronounced right? Or... Yeah, you got it. Okay. <laughs> and so, so by complete chance, I just saw her reading the book. And uh, me and my cousin started talking about it. And she was like, I know this author. I went to high school with her. Uh, yeah, so that's how I got put in contact with Kathleen. Um, I briefly assisted her at her indie publishing company, Rose Metal Press. And she's been a great source of career advice since then. And uh, this is actually something that I just learned recently. But um, I, did you go to, by chance, uh, go to my cousin's wedding? Or yeah. Okay, because someone in my family mentioned that, and I yeah. was actually the ring bearer at that wedding when I was like seven. Oh my gosh, so, that's so crazy, Liz and Dustin! Yeah. I love yeah. it. Way back in the way back machine, that's yeah. awesome. So apparently, I guess we saw each other at some point when I was like seven. So I had no idea. <laughs> oh my gosh, it. it's all in the timing. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, small world. So yeah, and also shout out to Liz if Liz, you know, listens to yeah. this and a show of cousinly support. <laughs> like, go DGN, go Trojans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll introduce you real quick. Um, so yeah, Kathleen Rooney is the founder of Rose Metal Press. Um, it's a publishing company that specializes in hybrid genres, um, which is like all the genres that the big publishers normally don't do, like flash fiction, novels in verse. Um, they also do a lot of poetry collections. Uh, she's the founder of Poems While You Wait, which is a, a collective of poets who will um, show up at events uh, with their typewriters and they'll, they'll write poetry on demand. Um, sounds fun. Um, and then on top of all that, she also teaches writing classes at DePaul University. She's their distinguished writer in residence. And uh, most importantly to this interview, though, she's an author. Um, so. Kathleen has either uh, written or contributed to, I think, 18 books. I, I don't know if that's the right number. I think that's right. I think, um, I mean, like my website has it. And I, I would, I think I recently did a count because I wanted to know since this book was coming out. And I think it's 13, you know, like single author type stuff. And then, um, you know, I've edited things, um, not with Rose Metal Press, but like Renee Magritte's selected writings and then okay. um, done chat books and other, you know, smaller collaborative things. So I feel like it's 13 solo like book books and then, yeah, like a handful of other weirder projects. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's done books across fiction, nonfiction, poetry. So novels and verse. So like basically every genre you can think of, you know, uh, and uh, her most recent novels include um, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Um, that one was a bestseller. And then she did uh, Share Ami and Major Whittlesey. Um, and uh, her most recent book, uh, From Dust to Stardust, just came out on September 5th. Um, so you guys can go check it out. Um, yeah. It's based on the life of Colleen Moore, who was one of the earliest movie stars during the era of silent films. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thanks for coming, uh, Kathleen. Thanks for appearing uh, on this and uh, uh, welcome. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. It's an honor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, could you start off by just giving us like a, a summary of uh, From Dust to Stardust and uh, tell us about why you wrote it? 
So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, handy visual aid, here it is. Um, and I think like the synopsis um, kind of stems from um, sort of my affinity for uh, structure and architecture. And so the book is organized and it's table of contents based on this real structure, the fairy castle. Um, so it's this real life thing that's at the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago. And when I say fairy castle, it's kind of like a dollhouse with, you know, cutaways and you can see into the rooms. Um, but because it was built by this movie star, it's incredibly lavish as in emeralds and mother of pearl and alabaster. So it's, it's astonishing. I just feel like you have to go see it. But if you can't go see it, um, you have my book. And so the book has this split structure where kind of like in Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk, you have this older woman who's had this phenomenal and exceptional career who's got a reason to look back over her life. And, and so in this case, I, it's based on Colleen Moore, but to be clear, it is fiction. And so I, you know, she's Doreen O'Dare in the book. Uh, to emphasize the, you know, liberties and embellishments, but it's 1968, it's December, so it's like a Christmas story, and she's been summoned to this museum to record an audio guide for the visitors who are going to come and see this fairy castle, and so as she looks room by room, like I was showing in the table of contents, she sort of like walks into a room and is like, ah, the small hall, or ah, the library, and then that sets her drifting back over the memories of, you know, all the way back to childhood, to when she knew she wanted to be a star, to her big break, to her, you know, marriage to this big producer, to the collapse of it, to the talkie, you know, just like, you get the idea, but it's, um, I don't know, we'll probably talk about this more as we, as we go, but I think, um, for me, novels are the most architectural form of writing, and so this is a very architectural book. So my goal is that by the end of it, people will, uh, in addition to be being very entertained, they'll want to go see the fairy castle and they'll want to go watch as many of the real Colleen Moore's movies as they can. Yeah that sounds great yeah I, I really enjoyed reading it it was a pleasure to read it so I, I love historical fiction so yeah. Me too. So, so this book uh, came out on September 5th so just like a few weeks ago um, so how has the campaign for it been so far? Have, have you been overwhelmed with all the, the promotional events and the interviews and everything or yeah, it's um it's been fun. I've I was counting them up and I did um seven events in the first two weeks that it was out. And that was all just in Chicago. I'm starting to um travel more next month and in through the fall. But the great thing about being in a city like Chicago is that there's so many opportunities. So I love it. I think as writers go, I am very social. Like I love my alone time and I love to be just me and the book and doing my project and getting lost in a world, but then I also love it when the time comes to go share it with the world. And so I won't exhaust everyone with the details of the whole seven events, but like some highlights were I used to be a bookseller at Anderson's bookstore in Naperville, a wonderful independent bookstore. And I worked there when I was an undergrad and didn't have um, any books of my own. And so it was that classic thing of, you know, daydreaming as I was shelving the books, like, <laughs> can I do that? Like someday will someone, will a future version of me be shelving my book, you know? So, um, so that was cool. I always love to go there. I love independent bookstores and they, um, I did that event with Shelby Van Pelt, um, who wrote Remarkably Bright Creatures, which is a great book. Um, and she was awesome. And then, um, I did my Chicago lunch at the American Writers Museum, which shout out to them. If you come to Chicago, it's a great small museum. And then probably my favorite event. Um, I've loved them all for different reasons, but a week ago, set like last Saturday morning, I got to do a matinee screening of the movie from uh, The Power and the Glory from 1933. And it's one of Colleen Moore's four talking pictures that she made. And again, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up this answer, but she was one of the relatively small number of silent movie stars who passed her sound test and had the opportunity to continue to make pictures after synchronized sound came in. She didn't have an accent. She didn't have, you know, a squeaky voice. She could memorize lines like she could do all that stuff. And so um, it was a really fun thing to get to put her up on the big screen at the Music Box Theater, which is this theater in Chicago that was built in 1929. I feel like you love historical fiction. I mean, people who love historical fiction tend to 
love history. And so it was like living history. It was like being in a theater that was around when Colleen Moore was having her career. And um, I got to do an intro and her uh, granddaughter was there oh. and this granddaughter brought her um, son. So, and then like her, you know, brother, it was, it was a family affair. So it was like cool for these people to come up after and be like, wow, like it was so fun to hear grandma's voice on screen, you know, on the bit on the big screen. So it's been fun. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you have a tendency to write books that are loosely based on like real historic people. Um, so, for example, um, your novel in verse, uh, Robinson Alone, called back. Um, that seemed I think that was based on a real guy. Um, yeah. Harry Weldon Keys. Right. Yep. And then uh, Lillian Boxfish takes a walk. Those seem to be based on a real historical person. Yeah. And Margaret then, uh, Yeah. And then uh, Shara Ami you know, yeah. and then finally from dust to stardust, that's, that's based on a real, um, uh, Hollywood actress. So what do you think attracts you to, uh, these types of stories? Yeah, I think yeah. I've always had a fascination with the past and with the people and animals and ways of life that have come before us. And I think part of that is from being like a, naturally bookish kid and then you know the kinds of stuff that were in my parents house and then also from being raised um in a very religious catholic household with the emphasis on you know the ancientness of the church and the emphasis on saints and the people who were martyrs and the people who you know spread the faith and died for the faith and so i think catholicism is a very beautiful religion and also an extremely morbid religion, which I say with not a critique, just an observation. Yeah. And if anything, I like it, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's very much about, you know, the body will suffer, the body will die. And like, what do we remember from the past? Yeah. And so, gothic. yeah, yeah, super yeah. gothic. And so I think um, in another a, a profile, one of my favorite things, not to like be like, oh, and the favorite thing someone wrote about me, but um, yeah. this wonderful writer, Elizabeth McNeil, did a profile of me for Chicago Review of Books. And she said that I was wholesomely gothic. And I think that covers it. So I think I'm yeah. fascinated by history and dead people because it feels life affirming in a weird way to focus on people who are dead and, but also interesting because they're dead. And so it's like wholesomely gothic. But I think what I um, enjoy as a writer in the process and then doing stuff like this is, we, I think, especially as Americans, and you know, there are exceptions and wants to be careful of generalizations, have a tendency toward being much more future thinking and having like kind of a historical amnesia. Yeah. And I think that's at best a shame because you miss out on a lot of interesting people and things. And at its worst, kind of dangerous because you are ignorant to what you have to draw on or you sort of don't have these examples, you know? So it's like, I feel like taking Lillian you know, she, like, Margaret Fishback was the highest paid female advertising copywriter in the country in the 30s, and I think, you know, most people think, like, oh, Mad Men, and, you know, advertising's always been this, like, big, you know, hyper-masculine, kind of toxic environment, um, and it certainly became that, but it wasn't always that, and so I think, not that you need to, like, have your writing be put to any kind of, like, overtly political agenda, but I think it's super useful, and you can get this from regular history, but I think um, historical fiction emphasizes the subjectivity of history, so you can go back and find these people and be like, oh, wow, we, you know, we are reinventing the wheel, we are going through, like, Me Too, or whatever it is, or climate change, but, like, oh, look how we, like, harmed animals during World War One, or look how, you know, what women had to do in the 30s before, you know, women in the 60s had to come back and do it all over again, and now we're, like, doing it all over again, you know, so it's like, I don't know, it's just, um, I think people miss out when they don't look to the past. Yeah. Yeah. I think in a previous interview, you said that um, Americans are biased against the dead. I think yeah. that's, that's how you put it. That, yeah. That's a good yeah. way to put it. Sums it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that was with yeah. Ignatius. Shout out to Ignatius um, Aloysius, who's a great <laughs> Chicago writer who I think, you know, got me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So at, at one point, um, so I know in some of these books, you use the person's actual name and identity, and then in other books, you will make make up an identity. Um, so at, at what point do you decide it's better to kind of make up a fictional character or go with the real person? Yeah, great question. I um, So if we count Robinson alone, which is based on, um, like you said, Weldon Keys, 
Um, and then Lillian Boxfish, Sherami, and now from Dust to Stardust, uh, you know, three out of four, I have um, made up names and not that, you know, writing is like data driven or anything, but I think I haven't put it that way to myself yet. So I'm taking your question as a chance to be like, hmm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, three fourths of the time I've, I've done that. And I think um, the reason that I do, I, I would say I prefer changing the names because um, to me as a writer, like when I'm in the stage of writing it, that helps me have the freedom and the permission and the wherewithal to invent and embellish and leave stuff out. Like, you know, for example, like there was this really interesting, like the real Colleen Moore, you know, I think some of it's like what's in there and is the same, but it's also like what you leave out. And she um, was shooting this movie called The Desert Flower, which is lost now. You can't watch it. It's, oh. It doesn't exist anymore, but she broke her neck. She was doing a stunt. Like she did all her stunts um, for the most part. And back in those days, stunts were like super dangerous. I mean, they still are, but they didn't have any of the protocols in place. And she fell and broke her neck and it was, um, she almost got paralyzed for life. And that was so fascinating. But I, you know, as I was writing, I was like, ah, that's so important to like Colleen Moore. It's out in the weeds for Doreen O'Dear. So I just cut that, even though that was like a huge part of the real woman's life. I was like, yeah, I just can't, you know? Um, so I think it, it frees you up to do stuff like that because then you're not, you know, misrepresenting it as a biography or being like ethically questionable um, in doing that. But, you know, so I think it, aesthetically it's good. And then when it's finished, it's good because it helps the audience understand like, yes, I do want you to go watch Colleen Moore's movies, but Dorian O'Dare is not Colleen Moore, you know, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And, but however, with Sheremy and Major Whittlesey, which is the um, outlier so far, um, I think it's because their history felt somehow different. It's not that Margaret Fishback wasn't super famous and there's millions of newspaper articles about her or that, you know, obviously Colleen Moore. I mean, she was in the gossip columns and like the trades all the time. But it felt somehow like American history, like war history, like World War One history, like Sheremy is stuffed in the Smithsonian. I just was like, I, I don't need to change their names. It just, yeah. it felt... I mean, I'm not like judgmental and I don't want to be like, it was disrespectful. Like another author could make another difference. So I'm not saying everyone has to do the same thing, but somehow to me, it felt like the respect or the like gravitas of what they did. I was like, I'm just going to use their name. So yeah. I love your question. I feel like my answer is a little okay. rambling. It's, it, it's intuitive. It's instinctual, but I, yes. I like, I have my reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So last, last year I uh, wrote a book about my great grandparents. Um, uh, and it's kind of dramatizing their lives, but it's it, it uses them as actual characters in the story. And so I ran into a lot of dilemmas where I had to figure out what what parts to leave, to embellish, to keep out, because like you want to be respectful of them, because um, you don't want to make the families angry, and right, uh, and so you don't want to scandalize them, but you you also want to like create some drama in the story. So yeah. there's dilemmas like that. Um, did you run into any any things like that while you were writing about um, uh, Colleen? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, like this is part of why I like writing, you know, fiction as opposed to biographies. And like in your case, you know, you weren't like, here's a memoir of me and my, you know, my my relatives or my ancestors. But you're like, it's a novel. So I feel like yeah. one of the things I love is that even regarding like, do you change the name? Do you not change the name? Just simply being like this is a novel I think gets you into the realm of a lot of freedom um but I think a lot about how even when I'm embellishing or omitting or amping up I'm usually doing so to convey like the spirit of the truth if not the literal truth and the um so this is something that like I teach at DePaul, this book called Imaginative Writing, which is um, edited by Janet Burroway, who's a great, you know, creative writing teacher and probably people listening if their teachers are like, I know that book. Um, but in her section on, and granted it's creative nonfiction, but I think it crosses over. She talks about how in the ethics of creative nonfiction, which of course is nonfiction applying the techniques of fiction to make it, you know, come alive on the page. As long as you're writing with the absence of an intent to deceive, she's like, you're probably okay, right? Like if, you know, nobody's going to read it and be like, oh, you didn't like have a tape recorder when your mom said that to you when you were seven. And it's like, yeah, but it's, the, you know, you get the idea. I'm not trying to like lie. I'm just trying to like capture the spirit. And so I feel like even though fiction is made up, it's like all made up for me in the service of creating like whatever it was I was fascinated by in the first place. So 
for me, like a thing that fascinated me with Colleen Moore was her um, joie de vivre. Like she just seemed like a person who, even though she was going through all this horrible stuff, like even though she had this husband who tried to kill her twice, you know, et cetera, like that sucked, but she like didn't let it um, define her or keep her down. And so I, I tried to put stuff in here that would help show her indomitability. So for one thing that I was, you know, slightly nervous about, but I feel like to your point, you want to create drama. Um, by all accounts, the real Colleen Moore's mother and father were lovely people, like, you know, solid, supportive, middle-class people who were like, well, that's a little weird that our daughter wants to be an actor, but go for it, honey. And I was like, that's boring, you know? So I like killed off her brother and made it a tragedy and made her mom and dad like much more, you know, difficult and much more skeptical of this new pursuit. Cause you know, not just for like the family dynamic, but also like, to me, one of the things, and I kind of, you know, talk about it in the, you know, prologue of this, um, it's bonkers to me that if you're generous, like the silent movie era lasted from 1894, like all the way back to like the Lumiere brothers and these fragmentary things to 1929 when synchronized sound came in. So it's like, I feel like it would have been a challenge to become a star in this like totally bizarre and short-lived industry. So I, I amped up some of her um, various struggles. And then I also emphasized um, this affair that I think she almost certainly had with like a real person, but I just, again, it felt good to have it be fiction. Cause I was like, if anybody read it and was like, she did not like grandma did not do that. It would be like, I didn't say it was grandma, but luckily, and if they ever, you know, they might be listening to this cause they've been super supportive, but um, Alice, her granddaughter and her, um, daughter Judy Coleman who's in her 90s and lives out in California still have have read the book and have been like great and Alice said to me that um she thinks Colleen would have been like great with it too because she said that whenever Colleen her grandma would tell a story she would acknowledge that she was an exaggerator and she was like if you have a story and it's boring just embellish embellish so I think it's okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it's great that you got to meet her family um mm. Yeah, I, I'm sure they loved it. So yeah. yeah, they've been great. It's been it's yeah. been super cool. And Alice is an artist too, like a visual artist. So I think she, you know, she gets she gets the the headspace and the process and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this at the beginning of the interview. So we'll tie back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about how you've published books on many genres. You've done poetry, nonfiction, novels and verse. And you were saying how the novel seemed to be the most structured out of all of them. Um, so um, a lot of authors, they spend a lifetime just trying to master like one form, like poetry, yeah. or, like prose. Um, but so you seem to have uh, experience with all of them. So how do you, uh, what's it like jumping between the different genres? Do you have to reset your brain every time you go between them or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yes, I think I love being able to write in all the genres because they all demand a different thing and they all have different rewards. And so I think for me, like poetry and nonfiction are a lot more like, this is just for me. So I'm not saying this is like inherently what they are. This is just as I experience them more inherently suited to winging it like I think it's easier for me personally to show up and just be like I don't know I'm just gonna write a poem I'm just gonna Organic. literally see what's in here just like put it on the page mess around see what happens yeah. same thing with essays where I'm like oh, okay this is like obsessing me I'm gonna take some notes and then I'm gonna like chunk them around like Legos and see if they build anything maybe they do maybe they don't um so very much like lackadaisical and then the structure comes later so I guess you know TLDR poems and essays I often find the structure after I've started messing with it with novels again so far and I'm open to change I have to have an outline I have to have an idea of like okay you know Lillian's going to be going on a walk or Shara Mee is going to be in the museum and Whittlesey is going to be on this ship deck and like the first lines of each chapter are going to repeat and they're going to you know and like with this I was like okay it's going to be a tour through the castle and she's going to see the garden and then she's going to go in and then she's going to you know and by the end we're going to like light the Christmas tree um so yeah so I think you know that's kind of it is a reset on the brain because um, I think I'm not saying everyone should do this, but again, I feel like I talk to my friends who don't outline or who don't emphasize structure in novels and they're the ones who are like, yeah, so I wrote 500 pages and then I had to throw it all out because yeah. like, then I finally figured out what I was doing and I'm just like, oh no, like I can't, I'm like, that sounds, that sounds like hell to me. So I just, I don't like that. I, you know, but it's just a me thing. <laughs> Yeah. 
yeah, there isn't enough time in the day to uh, to write a book if you have to throw away 500 pages. <laughs> Not for me. Yeah. Not for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a, a particular passage from the book uh, that that you would like to uh, read to cl close out the interview? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I would like to read uh, like a little bit from maybe the epilogue. Okay. Um, and it's just, it's not a spoiler, but I think I'm just going to read this, this much of it because I think it's a okay. nice little end. Okay. So the castle in moonlight. So this is after she's narrated the whole thing and she's getting ready to go do one last thing, which I won't ruin the surprise. <laughs> I hike up my glove to check my watch. I have an engagement this evening for which I can't be late, but it looks like I still have plenty of time. I feel fortunate watching my friends age that I can still remember everything. They can recall their youths without flaw, but later events disintegrate. I'm not sure which I'm more sad about, them or the ones who died too soon. When stomach cancer took Marion Davies in 61 a few months after Jack, she was funny till the end. What's your dying wish? I asked her. Anything you want. She wished not to die, then gloated over the loophole she'd found. These days I serve on boards. I organize quiet philanthropy. 18 years of flashing across screens was plenty for me, thanks. Now being behind various scenes is pleasing. When my parents and I were in Hawaii as the fairy castle was beginning to take shape, my surfing instructor showed me a common day octopus that he'd found a mottled beast on the shallow reefs that shot a cloud of mystifying ink whenever threatened. With its predator discombobulated by the shimmering blur, the octopus escaped, safe, secret, and no longer seen. That was, at the time, what the castle was for me. A chance to stop saying, look at me, and instead say, look over here, while I disappeared. <laughs> Great. <Woo. laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. Yay, octopuses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, for all the people listening, um, all the listeners, you can get the book uh, uh, wherever books are. Where, where would you say they can get the book? Yeah, I'd say wherever books are yeah. sold. Um, yeah. I recommend, you know, it. get it through your favorite independent bookstore. I think, you know, supporting your local independent bookstores whenever possible. Um, but I realize not everyone has access to a great brick and mortar independent bookstore. So if that is you, um, I am a fan of uh, bookshop.org. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And if the store doesn't have it, they can order it for you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that's great for authors or tell your library too. I realize, you know, I would love it if you bought it, obviously, but, um, or bought several copies and gave it to your friends and loved ones. But <laughs> You know, if you ask your library to get a book, that's a great way to support an author too. Great. Yeah, well, thanks so much for uh, for coming on today. This is, you're the first uh, guest in this interview series. So Thank you. thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, happy to be the first and looking forward to the rest of it.